I want to thank everyone joining us today. Welcome class of 2020 and all the students and everybody tuned in. We are here today with a very special guest, Mayor Kasim Reed. Hi, Kasim. How you doing, Kashi? Hi, everybody. Hi, class of 2020. So he was uh, the 59th mayor of Atlanta and really a very powerful mayor. Did a lot for the city and uh, we're going to spend some time talking with him today about his journey and then we'll open it up for questions and you can ask what you have on your mind. So Kasim, tell yes. us please how you, first of all, where did you go to school? Um, I went to school at a little little place called Utoy Springs. It's right down the street from the house that I live in right now, right off Cascade Road in Southwest Atlanta. It was Utoy Springs Elementary School. Okay. And now it's uh, Quality Living Services. It's actually a senior citizens facility today. And then from Utoy Springs, I went to a school called Westwood High School, which is now West Lake High School. It's also about five or 10 minutes from where I am right now. So I've really spent uh, my entire life uh, in Southwest uh, Atlanta, where I still live today. Yeah. And, and then, then of course, from, uh, from Westwood, I went to Howard University, okay. which was my dream school. And I attended Howard for undergrad uh, and Howard University for law school. And then I came home and started running for office. So I graduated from law school um, when I was 25 in 1995. Um, practiced law and then uh, ran for the Georgia State House uh, in 1997 and 98. Uh, became the youngest state representative in the state of Georgia. Spent two terms in the Georgia House and then I ran for the uh, Georgia State Senate. Um, and then I served uh, five terms, six terms in the Georgia State Senate. And then I was fortunate enough to be elected 59th mayor when I was about 40 years old. It's quite a journey. Um, how did you get into politics? You were in school. You, yeah. I guess you decided you wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. So how did you get to lawyer and then from lawyer straight to politics? Well, you know, Kashi, like you, I, uh, my, my dad was a big influencer in my life. And so my dad um, was from Hartsville, South Carolina. My mother was from Spartanburg. And my father was involved in the civil rights movement in South Carolina. And really, um, most of his dreams became mine. Uh, my dad wanted to be a lawyer. I became a lawyer. My father wanted to be in politics. I got involved in politics. And really, um, the cool thing that he did uh, was to have our plans be aligned. So while I think I was doing most of the things that he wanted me to do, um, it was really his dream as well. And so um, he was just the most impactful figure in my life along with my mom. And it ended up being something that I love. I mean, I absolutely love public service. And so uh, I lived a life to get there. Um, when I was 13, as you know, we have a great mutual friend I met a man named Ambassador Young who was speaking at Men's Day at Ben Hill United Methodist Church when I was 13. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my mom was really impressed with him. He was really nice to me that day, took a few minutes with me, messed up my high top fade. <laughs> and I went home, they used to have these things called encyclopedias. And I read about this person and his name is uh, Ambassador Andrew Young. So when you would read about Dr. King, you would invariably read about uh, Ambassador Andrew Young. When I was 19 years old, he and I were on the board of Howard University together. I was a student trustee on that board and he started mentoring me. And he said that I should come back home um, because the city was gonna need a mayor like me in about 20 years. And almost exactly 20 years later, he was sitting by my side when I got the phone call that I had won uh, the election for mayor. And so the great thing about Atlanta is there's so many terrific influences and people who give you a fair shot and a fair shake. I think that's what differentiates the city of Atlanta from other places. I mean, in one generation, um, I went from a family from 
two small towns in South Carolina to being mayor of the capital city of the South, the most influential city in the Southeastern region of the United States. And I think that that dearly speaks to Atlanta. And so I also think that- Why do you think, think that is? Why do you think Atlanta is so different in that respect? Um, because the openness has been a key to success. And I think that people come to Atlanta as a part of that openness. And I think it's just the best place to get a fair shot and a fair shape. What do you do and as I a student that, when, it, when you're not in a city like Atlanta and you are looking for these opportunities? How do you make those? Um, I think that, that you make them by knowing what you want to do. Um, you have to really know what you want to do and then you have to, to put all of your physical and intellectual capacity into living your dream. You owe yourself, you owe yourself giving your dream a shot. Mm -hmm. So even if you end up being whatever you ultimately end up being, don't let it be because you never gave what you actually wanted a shot. I remember when I was running for state representative in 1998, I made the decision that if I didn't win that election, that was probably going to be it for me in politics because the politicians that I admired um, had really made their careers uh, early. They had early trajectories. Mm. And so um, I viewed my run in 1998, which a lot of people thought was a long shot, as pursuing my dream. And then it took hold because I had wanted to be mayor since I was 13 years old. Really? So, Why is that? Um, Primarily because of the influence of Ambassador Andrew Young, okay. the influence of my dad, and uh, we mapped out my career in excruciating detail. I mean, I had uh, I had five-year plans that were very detailed from the time I was 18 until the time I was 40. Wow. Still have notes from those things, and my dad used to write me letters where he described what my life was going to be like. So, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but it worked. I mean, uh, Whatever works for you, right? If you're a planner, yeah. do it, you know, but it's good to yeah. have a plan, even if it's yeah. a little fuzzy. Yeah, but I mean, for our 2020 class, um, take your time and figure it out, but don't take forever. Right. And then once you know what really, what really, makes your eyes open up in the morning without an alarm clock. It makes your heart race a little faster. And once you know that and it's sustained and, and hopefully God will align it with your skill set, um, go out and pursue it. And pursue it in a way where you can sleep at night knowing that you gave it um, a real shot. And that's why I'm delighted to be here with you and the folks from Supernova today. Well, we appreciate it. Um, I'd love for you to tell our students to share the story that I've heard you tell before about a call that you received when you were in office yeah. and how you took what happened with you and the rest of your journey as mayor and did that fuel you? Please tell the story and then I'll... Yeah. Which one? We've shared so many stories. I know. Um, the we one you, the audience in on them. Um, where you got the call from another uh, from mayor. Dave? Yes. Oh, yeah. So um, in the world of mayors, uh, Mayor Daly is viewed as, I mean, he was one of the most talented, accomplished mayors uh, in America. And when I first got elected mayor, uh, in my first year, I did pension reform because the city of Atlanta was going broke. When I got elected, we had about $7.4 million in reserves, and we were facing a budget shortfall, 50 to $75 million, depending on who you believe. In my first day in office, I had to sign a tax, ante tax anticipation note loan so that payroll would clear. So it was literally the first thing that I did after I was sworn in and sat in my chair in the mayor's office. They came in and told me we were broke and that I needed to sign the tax anticipation note loans right away. One of the reasons we were broke was because we had um, 
we were spending a, a, about a third of our cash on pension costs. They were just going through the roof. So I decided that we had to do pension reform or we were going to end up on a path of Detroit and then they, and would end up having to declare bankruptcy. So I started this pension reform process. I'm a brand new mayor, I'm 40 years old. I only get won by 714 votes. And you know, the phone rings and my assistant, Lily Cunningham, who had been with me through my legal career, um, told me Mayor Daly's on the phone. And so, I mean, you know, that's a serious call. So I, I went in my office, I put both my feet on the ground. I, I sat in my chair straight and, uh, and I told Lily, I said, send in the call. She sends in the call and uh, Mayor Daly said, Kashif. And I remember I said, no, it's, it's, sir, it, it's Kasim. And he said, okay, whatever. <laughs> and he said, I hear that, you, uh, that, that you're down there, you know, messing with, with those folks' pensions and you just got in office. And I said, uh, well, sir, you know, we, we need to do pension reform. He said, you must really like practicing law. And I said, no, sir, being mayor is a full-time <laughs> job. He said, well, I tell you what, you keep messing with those folks' pensions, you're going to be back to practicing law. And then he hung up the phone, and he must have had a really uh, old phone because it was extremely loud when it whole <laughs> hung up. But he was actually trying to be helpful to me and guiding me in my first year. Needless to say, that's advice that I didn't take. We passed pension reform unanimously. And now the city of Atlanta, when I walked out of the door, had the largest cash reserves in the history of the city, 200 million cash reserves. And the uh, fiscal condition of Atlanta has been changed uh, forever. But it was a great story. And uh, he was just wonderful to me during my eight years as mayor. So it is a great story. How did you decide? I think he'll pronounce, he can pronounce Kasim now, too. I hope he can. I'm <laughs> sure he can. Um, how did you decide not to take that advice? I mean, this is somebody that you respected, that was a mayor of this great city. Yeah. Like, what? how, how do you make that decision? Like, okay, I'm going to hear what you're saying, but it doesn't feel right? Or what? what was that? Well, so here's the call that I made. I felt that there are two things that happen when you don't meet your pension payments. The first thing the state does is they take your sales taxes. And the second thing the state does is take your charter. Hmm. So we were either going to solve the pension crisis or we were really going to cease to be a city. And uh, I just wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to happen to me while um, I was in office. And I also thought that um, there's a book called Instruction to Deliver by Michael Barber, and it basically says that if you get the fundamental operations of a city right, you're able to do the things you're actually passionate about as a public service. Basically, if your taxes aren't going up, your water bills aren't going up, you're not getting knocked over your head when you go to your car, you feel like your neighborhood's safe, and if someone says that we need to open recreation centers to help children citywide, if someone says we need to provide warm meals for children citywide, if someone says we need to expand green space in the city of Atlanta citywide, you're more likely to get a yes on those other things if you get a yes on the basics. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I wanted to govern. If we hadn't done pension reform, we would have had to have passed massive tax increases in the worst recession since this one. So I was elected in 09, uh, sworn in in 2010. That was in the midst of the worst recession in 80 years. And so people were already hurting a great deal. And if I had passed a massive tax increase rather than reforming uh, our pension system, I just believe that uh, Atlanta wouldn't be the city that it is right now. And I think another thing that you did a lot um, and you continue to do is you really worked across the aisle. And so why was it important to you, even though there were people that thought very differently from you, why was it important for you to do that? Many people in your place have not chosen to work across the aisle. 
So why did you decide that that was the route you wanted to take? And how do our students today apply the principle that you decided to take to their careers? Well, I worked across the aisle because of the training that I had received in the General Assembly. See, I actually spent longer uh, in the George, at the Georgia State level, four years in the House, seven years in the State Senate, than I had in municipal government. So, as you know, uh, from your deep roots in Georgia, uh, in order to, to make real change and move real progress through the state, um, you have to have bipartisan support. It's just the nature of the state. Mm -hmm. And you can do that without sacrificing your morals and your values um, because no means no, whether you say it loudly or softly. Uh, I, got, I, I ran for office to do amazing things and to get things done. And what I wasn't going to allow was to have bad relationships that weren't based in anything or, or that weren't based in uh, issues that related to my job as mayor um, keep me from succeeding. I mean, when, when I got elected, uh, employment was, unemployment was higher than 10%. And so uh, Governor Deal, uh, who was the Republican governor when I was mayor and, and Governor Purdue, um, there were, they understood that for the state to succeed, Atlanta had to run well and thrive and be prosperous. Mm -hmm. And so Democrats and Republicans, you know, might disagree on 75 to 80 percent of things. So work very hard on that 20 percent. And when you need things done for your folk, you, you're more able to do them. I mean, at the end of the day, people elect politicians to win for them to the extent that they believe that you're winning more for them than you're losing, you tend to keep getting elected and you tend to keep winning. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, um, we were able to do some amazing things and we were able really to get unemployment down um, to the lowest levels than uh, until, until recently. And so if how do you look at the projects we passed, we just couldn't, we couldn't have done them without having those bipartisan relationships. Absolutely. And so um, how do students take that mindset into the world that they're encountering today? I think you take that mindset, um, one, because it's healthier for you. You can't walk around angry all of the time. I think that that's personally unhealthy. And I also don't think that it's... Um, best for our community of the country. Um, we, we cannot continue to stay angry at one another in the manner that we are right now and have a great America. And that might seem like a big conversation, but it's really a very local one that we just get more stuff done when we're cooperating. Mm -hmm. And so right now, that notion is taking a tremendous beating, but it's still right in my belief. I believe that when you choose cooperation over conflict, you have a better opportunity to get big things done that help the most people, which really ought to be the only reason you're in politics. Right. right? The only reason you should be in politics is because you want to do good on a larger scale. So the things that I'm interested in sitting in my home right now I was interested in before I was mayor of Atlanta, but the difference is if there was a community that was having issues with crime, I could hire 900 police officers, build the biggest police force in history, drop crime by 40%, um, drop teen crime by 25%, arrest less young people, open up recreation centers, put 2,500 people in recreation centers, drop teen crime, um, stop more people from getting police records. But it's the same thing I feel right now. Right. But when you are mayor, you have the lever to move in that direction. And so um, I think that's really what the essence of politics is about. So one more quick question for me, and then we'll go to students. To follow up on what you just said, um, it's, I know you're also investing in technology companies and other companies. Yes. Um, do you see parallels between how you can help as mayor and how you can help through technology and private industry? 
Absolutely. I mean, if you look in the tech space, one of the biggest things we did in the technology space was we started an entity called Engage. That was my idea. Mm -hmm. So after taking multiple trips to Silicon Valley, what I learned in Silicon Valley was that Atlanta's big companies weren't investing in the early stage funding. So I went to the largest companies in the city of Atlanta and got them to put up between 1 million and 2 million per entity. They raised 15 million for early stage investment in terrific startups. It also creates a relationship between the Coca-Cola and the Wells and the SunTrust of the world, which were highly risk averse around Atlanta's technology businesses. And now through Engage, they're having that conversation. The other thing we did was to be present and be involved. Uh, anytime there was a startup opening, uh, that I was invited to be involved with. I wanted to be there. When you started Supernova, it was an easy meeting for you to have. I wanted to be there because the mayor is an amplifier of positive things. And I know from all of my visits to Silicon Valley and Palo Alto and all of the rest in San Francisco, that Atlanta has the technology talent to be the center of gravity in our part of the United States of America. I know that because when you're in Silicon Valley, you can't go anywhere without bumping into anybody from Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that NCR is near Georgia Tech right now is because of a conversation just like this one between myself and Bill Newdy, who moved 5,000 jobs from when, when NCR was in Gwinnett and built a quarter of a billion dollar campus uh, a few blocks away from Georgia Tech. So my point is when you are mayor, your ideas and your passion end up being, uh, end up in concrete results. So that was Bill Newdy leading a great company and me having the opportunity to meet him uh, after he expressed his disappointment uh, in what the city was doing in the technology space. And we changed that and then ended, ended, up, ended up building um, what I think is, is a part of the fabric of Atlanta as the center of gravity in the Southeast and to be the dominant city in the Southeast. I remember when I first got elected, me, everybody used to talk about Charlotte, North Carolina and Charlotte this and Charlotte that. You don't really hear people really talking about Charlotte as a competitor to the city of Atlanta anymore. And so I think everybody in a leadership position uh, has an obligation to to push the ball as fast as they can. And that's what I try to do. Um, yeah, and you definitely pushed hard. Um, I have a question from a student. Yes. Uh, Anthony would like to know, um, is there a difference between a role model and a hero? And if you think there's a difference, then who is one of your role models and who is one of your heroes? I think that there's a, a difference between a role model and a hero. I also think that they can be the same. So that it's a kind of a, for, a false choice to have them be um, exclusive. Um, obviously, beyond my dad, my role model really was uh, Ambassador Young because he took an interest in me when I was 20 years old and really has been a presence uh, to today in every aspect of my life. I mean, this is a man who... Um, at 86 years old, your phone will ring and he will say, this is Andy. I, I was just thinking about you mm -hmm. um, with everything that he's done. And when you're where I am and, and you know that that's exactly what he used to do for Martin, as he refers to him, meaning Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. he basically plays that same role to this day. So I think that he was both a role model uh, and a hero. He's that blend uh, that, that I certainly am talking about um, outside of my own dad. I mean, this is a man who literally when I was 20 years old said that I would be mayor of Atlanta. So when you think about that as a 20 year old, the impact that that can have on your behavior and your confidence and what you believe about yourself. And he didn't just say it one time, he said it over 20 years. And folks really didn't understand um, why he stuck with me because when I ran for marriage, you know, Kashi, uh, I was losing for almost the entire campaign. So 
there were multiple opportunities for him to move in a different direction or move away from me or, or not to believe in me. And so um, he would certainly be a concrete example. Another man who I care a lot about and admire is a, a gentleman named Vernon Jordan, who's from Atlanta. Um, he has been an advisor to multiple presidents and uh, he's a man that I met on the board of Howard University um, that has just been a terrific guy. And then a third example would be a gentleman named Willie Brown, who is the mayor of the city of San Francisco and has a completely different style from Andrew Young. Um, and I think that when I would get advice uh, during difficult times in my life, uh, I would be on the phone with Ambassador Young, Willie Brown, who was the Speaker of the California Assembly, the longest serving speaker in the history of the California Assembly, and then two-term mayor of San Francisco, a city that's about 5% Black. And so between he, Vernon Jordan, and Ambassador Andrew Young, I always felt uh, that that I was getting really sound advice. And I still speak to those men to this day. I really like what you said, and I think this is so important, that what you believe about yourself is self-fulfilling. Yeah, you are right. So if you believe right. something positive that you can be mayor, you can be mayor. Yeah. But if you think you can't be mayor, you're absolutely right, you can't be mayor. Yeah, corny tip for the people at Supernova. Um, I taped, I am going to be mayor of Atlanta by the time I'm 40 on my mirror and, and said it to myself every day for at least a decade. That is focus. Yeah. So everything you did was centered on that goal. It was. And if, you, and if you look at the notes of my five year plans between my dad and I, I mean, it was, I mean, it was, written down to the organization, Outstanding Atlanta, Leadership Atlanta, Leadership Georgia. If you look at the organizations that I was involved in, the things that I was a member of, um, we did an analysis of the bios of everybody that had the job that I want, wanted. And we looked at what had the people that had that job done in their lives. That was a big part of the reason that I decided to go to Howard University because Ambassador Young had gone to Howard University. And if you looked at Howard, um, it had the most prominent cadre of black Americans. Thurgood Marshall went to Howard University. The mayor of Washington, D.C. went to Howard. Mayor Shirley Franklin went to Howard University. So Atlanta has three mayors from Howard University and one mayor from Morehouse, as much as I love Morehouse. Um. So there's something going on up there. Yeah, and it sounds like you were using big data before it was a thing. Yeah, I didn't call it that. I, <laughs> we called it research back in the day. Right, that's what it was called. <laughs> it's, like our, it's like the running joke that you and I have about curate. Yes. I think, I think, you know, I think things used to be planned. Now they're curated. But. They're curated. Everything's curated. <laughs> um, okay, so another question from a student. Um, from uh, Heather. This year has taken a turn I never expected. I think that's true for all of us, Heather. Yes. Um, virtual classes, job loss, uh, loss, isolation, applications for college, etc. Everything has been delayed or stopped altogether. My question is, where do I start when all of this is over? Yes, yeah, so where you should start right now is making sure that everything that, that is positive about your life that you can control stays intact and isn't harmed during the downturn. So that's what you need to be doing right now. You need to maintain your physical capacity and use this opportunity to be in the best psychological and mental shape that you can possibly be in. So that when we move to a position to go, you're gonna be in a highly competitive environment. So you need to be the person that in a more competitive environment is the person that people are, are going to want to be partners with, invest with, and hire. Mm -hmm. So what I would do right now is use all of your time right now to make yourself as, as good as you possibly can be. 
limit anything that would be harmful to your long-term prospects to the greatest extent that you can and do not get down or be defeated right now. Know that when things begin to be no more normal, because they're not going to be the same ever, that you are well positioned to be the person that people say yes to. And you have to be optimistic right now. When we come out of this pandemic, not into normal, but into a new reality, you're going to have to be vibrant and optimistic and healthy. One of the biggest pieces of advice that I constantly give to young people is you are not going to be young forever. <laughs> and that you have to use your physical capacity right now because you're not always going to have it. And when you're sitting in your teens, your 20s, and your 30s, you literally believe that you're going to have the ability to stay up all night, have no sleep, jump up and go to work forever. And I'm telling you, you're not. And it makes a massive difference in how those years were used. If one were to look at the arc of my career and the arc of a whole lot of other people that have had some success in their lives, it is their utilization of their early years, which is the springboard for whatever happens in their 40s and 50s and 60s. So use it. Act. Make sure you're healthy. Yeah, it's like laying a good foundation, right? Yeah, and then it, from it there, is you like can that. do whatever. It is like that, but it's even more. It's being a beast while you can be a beast. Yes. You are not a beast at 40 or 50 years old. You, you might be a beast in your mind, but, uh, you know, if I were in office right now, I wouldn't be worried about a guy who was 50 years old running against me. I'd be worried about somebody that was 25 or 30 or 35 who would get out and knock on a thousand doors and go to every single event and campaign until two or three or four in the morning. That is a physical capacity issue. That's a force multiplier. And I'm sorry to go long about that, but I thought it was a pretty big deal. Great advice. Um, along the learns of advice, what is the best advice you have gotten so far? And that question, I just saw it. Uh, is from Brian. The best advice that I've gotten so far is to take advantage of your physical capacity and to act. Hmm. Um, the world is decided by people who took their shot and who didn't. We live on a planet with 7 billion people on it and about 95% of the 7 billion people wake up every single day to do a job to sustain themselves. Think about that. There are six and a half billion people on earth who wake up and go to a job where the purpose of the job is to feed their, themselves, clothe themselves, and keep a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. So they're really about half a billion, let's be generous and say 750 million people on earth who are waking up to do what they are passionate about. The tool that you have to determine your outcome is your physical capacity and what you do with your time. And whether you talk about it or live it. And what I decided was win, lose, or tie, it wasn't going to be because I didn't go for it. Right. And that's what I think that the class of 2020 has to think about every day. You're, you know yourself. You know what you're doing better than everybody else in the world. Are you really living a life that is consistent with what you dream of doing, with what's in your head, with what makes you smile? I loved every single minute of being married in Atlanta. I loved it all. <laughs> I loved it all. Yeah. And How do you I love the tough that, moments? I think that because you have to love it all, you know what you're getting into when you run for high office. You know it. You know what you're getting into when you found a company. You know what get you're getting into when you become a teacher. You know what you're getting into when you become a nurse. I mean, I think of all of these people on the front line who are going to work every single day. 
by me and my family are at home. So much of that is driven by passion. Mm -hmm. And so that only comes from what you do with your physical time. You know, quick, quick story. There's a guy, a kid, he's 13 years old. He's in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he's a, a, a child of a single mom. Decides he wants to help his mom. Goes downtown, takes uh, calls the Charlotte Museum. He's a 13-year-old kid. People in the Charlotte Museum hang up on him. He keeps calling. They keep hanging up on him because he's a kid. He takes the bus to the Charlotte Museum. He goes into the Charlotte Museum. People are on their lunch break. He sees a pail, a bucket, and mop. He takes that mop. He starts mopping up. They return and see this kid mopping. They ask him what in the world he was doing. He said, I've been calling to try to get a job, but nobody will respond to me. He's 13 years old. They give him a job at the Charlotte Museum doing odds and ends. That kid ends up becoming Anthony Fox. He becomes uh, the 17th Secretary of Tr Transportation for Barack Obama. That kid becomes the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. The example is do something. Right. What is the difference in his life and somebody else's life? We're all at our house thinking, man, I would love to do this, do that. Mm -hmm. The difference between the people that we are aware of is that the ones that we know about, they did something more than contemplated. And they did it in a decisive way. Mm -hmm. And that's my advice to the class of 2020. I think uh, that is we're a little over time. So that is some great advice to end on. Um, take action. Don't just think about it. But once, you, once you've thought about it a little bit and put your plan together, launch whatever it is you want to do. Because you can't be successful until you do it. Which is also the story of so much tech success. Right. The thing that I love about folks in your space, they go for it. It might not work. It might not make sense. It scares me to death sometimes when they explain what they're doing, but they're going for it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Well, you definitely went for it, and we hope that you continue to do that. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the class of 2020 and anybody else who's watching us for joining us today. We have um, we've talked about him quite a bit. Our next speaker coming up, Ambassador Andrew Young, uh, will be our next guest. And so, oh, wow. yeah, so I from one mayor to another, one Atlanta mayor to another. So um, please make sure you tune in for that. Um, you can find us by searching Supernova Commencements anywhere on the web. These videos are going to be posted for you to use as a resource again and again and again. Um, Congratulations to you graduates for finishing. That is a hard thing to do in life and it's a very important skill. Um, we wanna know what you are up to, so leave us a comment, share your success and any other questions you might have. And remember that it is a blessing to be a blessing. So see you next time. Congratulations class of 2020. Thank you, Kashi. Thank you. Bye.